Okay, so this is uh, chapter 10. This is the last and final chapter of uh, this book, Gilgal, written by Paul Janadu. This is uh, a chapter that's called, I Saw Jesus on the Cross. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your, your word, God. We thank you that um, as we hear and as we do your word, that we will see it manifest in our lives. We thank you, Father God, that <clears throat> that these books um, that were that were given to read that we, that we that we more than just read them, God. That we actually process what we're hearing, process what we're reading. Um, that we would we would be transformed. We would be transformed by the renewing of our minds day in and day out as we as we put our, our feet forward in pursuing love and pursuing righteousness and pursuing hope pursuing joy pursuing Jesus I thank you God that as we As we continue to carry our crosses day in and day out, denying our flesh, picking up our cross, and following you, I thank you, Lord, that it's not it's not an event, Lord. It's not a it's not a walk across America with our cross, but instead it's 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 a lifelong process of of denying our flesh, picking up our cross, and following you. As a matter of fact, personally. Um, I, I, when I teach on the cross, I, I teach that we don't even put it down. It's something that we pick up one time and we never put it down. We continually carry, sleep with our cross. We are, we are supposed to bear the cross, bear, bear the cross. We're supposed to carry the cross. The burden is the Lord's. The yoke is the Lord's. But when we cling to the cross, when we cling to the cross, we're clinging to Jesus. We're clinging to our Messiah. We're clinging to our King. Um, we're clinging to our Redeemer. We're clinging to our Deliverer. It's the cross that we must go through. It's the cross that we must pursue in our daily lives. We cannot put the cross down, we cannot hang the cross up with our, our armor, we don't hang the armor up. We do like the soldiers, like the Marine Corps does. They sleep with their armor, they sleep with their weapons, they sleep with their with their uh, their clothes, their war, clothes of warfare, they sleep with those things because they are 24 seven alert as we are to be alert, as the word of God says, to be wise as a dove, Yet gent or gentle as a dove, yet wise as a serpent. We are too to be wise, gentle as a dove, and wise as a serpent. We want to make sure that we are we are hearing, we are seeing, and we're discerning the things of God. Because if we're not carrying our cross, we decide to, for whatever reason, put the cross down and go for a walk without Jesus. Sure enough, the devil will be ready and he'll be waiting for you. It, the devil is not one to play with. He is not one to to joke around with. You, you cannot defeat the devil on your own. I guarantee you, it cannot happen. You cannot defeat Satan on your own without Jesus. It is impossible. The devil is smarter than you. He's more powerful than you. And he's wiser than you. Jesus was seated at, seated and Jesus was in heaven. Jesus was in heaven with God. Jesus knows God. He knows the word better than you know the word. He knows the word better than I know the word. The difference between the devil was he got prideful. He got prideful and wanted to start his own his own heaven. And and God wouldn't have that and neither will he have that today. He he, he let down his cross. He let down the cross. He let down. He he became so knowledgeable and so wise 
is so beautiful that he didn't need God any longer. And that's what happens to a lot of ministers of the gospel. They, they, they think that they can do it without him after they, they learn all about him and they, and they teach him for 50, 60 years. And it doesn't work that way. We have to cling to the old rugged cross because that's where the power of God stands. That's where deliverance comes. That's where truth comes. That's where peace comes. That's where prosperity comes. That's where joy comes. That's where happiness comes. The Bible says that may the joy of the Lord be our strength. That his mercies are new every day. So if you want to experience the love of God each and every day, that's part of our uh, that's that's our part of our our, our our instructions. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Don't follow your pastor. Don't follow your apostle. Don't follow the prophet. Follow Jesus. The prophet did not die for your sins. The apostle did not die. For your sins, your mom, your dad, your son, your husband, your wife did not die for your sins. Did not shed their blood for you. They, their blood does not have power to forgive sin. Only the, the blood of Jesus has the power to forgive sin. So let's let's read chapter ten, and let's let's hear what Mr. Janadu has to say about him seeing Jesus on the cross. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Very true in this case. For a brief moment. I saw Jesus hanging on the cross for me. Let's let's take a second right now, you guys. I feel the Holy Spirit wants us to do this as well. Let's stop. Whether if you're driving, you need you don't need to stop. But let's take. You know how they do for for the dead? They they give a moment of silence. Well. Let's give a moment of silence for Jesus. He's not dead. He's very alive and he's very active. But we're going to give a moment of silence for Jesus. And, and I want you guys to, to picture him hanging on that cross with a crown of thorns around his head, bleeding, with his hands pierced to the wood, bleeding, his ankles crossed, with a nail pierced through his ankle, bleeding for you, for me. As he said the so famous words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I think it's greater than him talking about the people that were actually killing him on the cross. He was speaking about you and me. He was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you realize the agony? Do you realize the pain? Do you realize the hardship? Do you realize the, the amount of love it took for Jesus, for God himself to come? How he had to humble himself? That yet while we were still sinners, he died for us. He came and, and, and he was born a baby. God, the Almighty God, Sovereign God, because He knew that you and I were incapable of doing what He had to come do. 
He needed to make a way for us. He had to come show us. He didn't die just for your sins. He came to die. He came to earth to show us how to live, how to talk, how to walk, how to work, how to tread on serpents and scorpions, how to do deliverance, how to pray, how to obey. obey. Did you have you said thank you God for today? Have you have you have you blessed God or are your prayers bless me O God? Bless him O God. Or bless me O God. Or, or are your prayers we want to bless God. Let's let's change our prayer from bless me God to teach me how to bless you God. For what you've done for me. For what you've done for my family. Look at your family. Look at your beautiful family you have. You have to give the glory and the credit to Jesus. If it wasn't for Jesus, you wouldn't have that beautiful family. If it was for Jesus, you wouldn't have your beautiful wife. If it wasn't for Jesus, you wouldn't have your ministry. If it wasn't for Jesus, you wouldn't be listening to me to me uh, talking right now. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, not Mr. Paul Janadu. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Mr. Janadu is a beacon of light. Mr. Janadu is, is, is a man that has stood up stood up for you and I. He's, he's, he's gone. He surrendered his life, his education, his work, the money, the, the, the tears, the prayers. He has surrendered. He has given his life as a bondservant of Jesus Christ for you and I to hunker down to show ourselves approved, to fight the good fight of faith, to remain faithful, because there's a mighty work to be there's a mighty work to be done. So let's give God the praise. Let's give God the glory and the honor that He so deserves. Let's stop following that man on YouTube. Let's stop following that woman on YouTube. Let's stop brown nosing everybody. Your pastor, your apostle, your prophet is not God. God is God. Your prophet, your pastor, your apostle cannot cannot forgive your sins. Jesus the one hanging on the cross saying, Father, forgive him. Father, forgive her for what she's doing. Father, forgive him for what he's done. It was as if he did it just for you and me. And he did. And he would have gone to the cross if you and I were the only sinners in the world. Oh, such love. That, that, that image should break us as it did him. He says, that image broke me. That image should break you and me. That's what a revival is. Revival is allowing the image of Christ on the cross to, to bend us, to break us, to humble us. He said, I forgot all my arguments 
Because with the vision given me came an outpouring of grace into his heart. As it should. I know now how Jesus can say, Father, let this cup pass from me. If not, then your will be done. <clears throat> there is tremendous power in God's grace that enables one to give, give beyond what you thought you had. It's not about your money. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need, God doesn't need your money. He doesn't want your money. Your money can't pay for can't pay for your salvation. When you die, you're not gonna have your money. You're not gonna have your wife. You're not gonna have your husband. You're not gonna have your children. You're not gonna have your mom and dad. It's gonna be you standing before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, having to give a hope, an answer for the hope that is in you. Are you ready to give an answer to God? Can you say without a reason of a doubt, I was a doer of your word. I denied myself and I picked up my cross and I followed you all the way here. Because I loved you, I obeyed you. The Holy Spirit became distinctly personal. Theologically, I knew there are three persons in the Trinity, but I couldn't tell them apart. I was just praying or praising God and hoping the appropriate person would accept it. The dealings by the Holy Spirit on my self line, and, uh, self line and the subsequent transfer of ownership of my body to his indwelling took about six months. In that time, I would say the Holy Spirit was the one speaking to me exclusively. So I became very familiar with his voice. Let me ask you guys, are you guys familiar with 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 uh, with with, uh, with Father God, with the Almighty God? Are you are you familiar with his voice? Are you having a hard time discerning his voice? If you're having a hard time discerning his voice, it's okay. There's room to grow. There's always room to grow. <clears throat> Don't think that, that you're not blessed or that you can't be blessed or you can't hear from God if you're not hearing from Him. God wants to speak to you. But you, you need to get rid of some things. You need, to, you need to surrender your life more. You need to bow down before the King. You need to be bow down before my King. He is worthy. He is worthy to be bowed down before. He, you must bow down before Him. Surrender your life to him. Give him your tears. Give him your fears. Give him your familiar spirit. Give him the spirit of the world. Give him pride. Give him lust. Give him perversion. Give it to him. Drop it at the cross. He'll give you, in return, he'll give you peace. He'll give you hope. He'll give you joy. He'll give you happiness. The Bible says, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He will give you rest for your soul. But more importantly, He will give you ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. He wants you to hear His voice. And He wants us to be able to hear His voice. On a personal level. His temperament and his style of relating with mortals like me became became familiar, and that's where we need to be, you guys. We need to be we need to be hearing from God, taking time in our prayer closets, wherever it is, whatever it looks like to you, taking time. To spend with Jesus. Taking time to read his word. Taking time to pray. Taking time to hear him in quiet and silence. Sometimes the best place to be is in silence. People don't like to be in silence because they're being tormented by demons. 
when they're in silence. I used to be there. I was there. I was one of those people. I, I always had to have there was something going on around me all the time, and I always had to keep be keeping myself busy so I wouldn't be, you know, sinning, sinning, and hearing for hearing hearing demons talking to me. That's that's what they do. That's their job to torment you. Jesus' job is to give you hope, life, and a future. So we bind all them demons. We bind all those devils that are speaking to your mind, your will, and your emotions. We command them to shut up and get out in Jesus' name. God is doing a, a mighty work in your life, man of God. Jesus is doing a mighty work in your life, woman of God. Don't give up. Don't give in to the de deceiver and devourer. He would love for you to give up. He would love for you to give in. Keep trucking. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. The battle belongs to the Lord. All we have to do is put our trust in Him, put our faith in Him, pick up, deny our flesh and pick up our cross and, and march forward with the shoes of the gospel of peace, forgiving those that hurt, harm us, praying for those who persecute us, that God would give them the spirit, grant them the spirit of repentance, that they would be that that their eyes, their eyes, the the blinders would be removed from their eyes. In Jesus' name, that they would see the light, that they would be singing this the song "Amazing Grace." How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We don't we don't wish we don't wish uh, harm on our enemies. We bless our enemies in the name of Jesus. We pray for our enemies. That's what a real man of God looks like. That's what a real woman of God looks like. Now he knows me. Even when I'm out, out of range, he knows me. When I'm turning a deaf ear, he knows me. To know him is very easy, for he wants to be discovered. The Bible says, seek. The Bible says, draw close to God and he will draw close to you. We are the ones who feel the need to be private and inaccessible, just like Adam and Eve hiding behind fig leaves in the garden. And I have something to say about that. The fig leaves, what happened to God? God actually knit. He gave them a new garment, even in the, even in the garden. He took away the eaves, the fig leaves. In the garden, he took him. He took him away, and he gave him a new garment, so that they didn't have to wake up every day looking at their at their fig leaves, looking at their sin, looking at the sin. He gave them new garments, even though they were separated from him. He still gave them new garments, because that was his. That's why he came. He came to rid us, to to forgive us, and to redeem us. He still followed through on his bargain. Therefore, we need to follow through on our bargain. If you've confessed Him as Lord and Savior, don't give up. Don't don't renounce Him. Don't just because things aren't going your way. Don't don't stop serving God and worshiping God. Now, when we say the grace and end it with and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, it rings true. The Holy Spirit. And I have opened our treasure chests. Both can look in each other's. He told me he doesn't mind if, if I'm not yet perfect. As long as my hands are clean and my heart is pure. The Bible says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. He gives a scripture here. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8-9 through 9 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So let's confess our sins right now. Those of you who, who are at home, who are at home or who are alone in your car, Confess your sins before God.
Here you go. Confess them. Confess those sins. He says that he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. Jesus says, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Get filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts, to Acts, and Acts says that we that repent, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost is not for you, it's for other people. It's so that so that you can win others to the Lord. So you can save win souls to, for Jesus. It's so that you can overcome and, and, and walk in victory. Have a victorious life. So you can have a testimony. It's by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his word of your testimony. That men are drawn to him. That men are drawn to you. Things I have gained from this encounter. Oh God, give me the desires of, of your heart. Yes, let's ask God to give us the desires of, his, of, of our heart. Repeat after me, say, God, give me the desires of your heart. I ask you, please, to give me the desires of your heart. Let me see others the way you see them. Let me love others the way you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. He says, I no longer pray that God will give me the desires of my heart, even though he has promised this. Instead, I pray for the desires of his heart. Amen. Let's pray for the desires of his heart. So, Father, right now, we pray for the desires of, of your heart. Because we believe that you know the best, best path that we need to take to fulfill your plan. Lord, give us the desires of your heart. Yeah, I think that's what I prayed. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe. Oh yeah, it's not. It's not the desires of our heart. We need. We want the desires of your heart. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Of your heart, give us the desires of your heart, O oh God. The desires of your heart are that is that none shall perish. The desires of your heart is that we would reign as kings and priests that stand holy and blameless before you in love. That's the desire of your heart, O oh God. Because you've created us before the foundation of the world. And that was that was the desire of your heart, was that we would stand holy and blameless before you in love. So help us to love others. Help us to forgive others. Help us to manifest manifest Christ on earth. Help us to, to walk in power. Help us to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Help us to, to, it's the children's bread. Deliverance is the children's bread. Help us to, to, to successfully cast the demons out of people and, and, and raise them up in the Lord and give them a foundation to stand on. So when the, when the, um, riots of the devil come and, and, and the storms come, and the temptations and the, and the trials come that 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 will be uh, victorious over them that the, the devil will have nothing in us help us to learn how to close all the doors to the world to the enemy help us how to have healthy boundaries in Jesus name a long time ago I learned a vital lesson God does not lead us in a direct path to our destinations God can lead us from London to Glasgow via Paris 
you will then discover that there is something you, ne you needed to pick up in Paris that is indispensable when you reach Glasgow, <laughs> if that's the truth. So I stopped leaning on my own understanding. <laughs> the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. It's in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. When Pharaoh, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. In Exodus chapter 18, verse 17 through 18. We see this pattern in the life of Joseph also. God gave him dreams about his future big enough for his brothers to become jealous but God did not lean but God did not lead him in a direct path to Pharaoh's court when Joseph had the dreams he was not ready for their fulfillment he would certainly have treated his brothers with less magnanimity magnanimity had the hand of the Lord not been heavy upon him in prison not allowed to defend myself one thing, one of the things I don't find easy to stomach is when people who sh should know better tell untruths about me. My natural instinct would be to speak out and put the record straight. But nine times out of ten, the Holy Spirit would warn me, not a word. So I allow people to form an opinion based on, based on fake news. When I asked why the Holy Spirit was leading me this way, he pointed me to Jesus. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Matthew chapter 27, verse 12 through 14. We need not only need a Peter in our lives, people who would declare the truth as revealed by God because they carry a pure heart toward us. We also need a Judas who will send us to the cross. If we are to carry our cross daily, God must choose someone to nail us on it. Men with a mission. I once asked the Holy Spirit why he allowed some people I trusted and allowed room in my heart to end up damaging me. Actually, what I was thinking was, Dear Lord, give me a break. I wanted God to select only those who accept me and believe in me, warts and all, <laughs> to gain my confidence and come close. His answer was quite revealing. He told me that without such people in my life, I would ne never become a man made by God. God, he continued, only makes man from the dust. I should not look at the people he sent my way. I should only concern myself with their mission. When they finish their mission, they will either change or move on. However, more likely they will not change. But I would no longer feel the pain. That is because I had changed. You will never reach your Calvary without a Judas. But I refrain, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6 through 9 says, But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me but he said to me my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me that is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses in insults in hardships in persecutions and difficulties for when I am weak then I am strong the Holy Spirit touched many more areas and pressure points in my life then and since 
This experience has no emotional components at all. It was all a battle of the will. Who will yield first, me or the Holy Spirit? I am glad that in most cases I yield. Until recently I was under the impression that this kind of close encounters with the Holy Spirit was primarily for those called to the ministry. It is now becoming clear that the Holy Spirit wants the same level of commitment and total surrender from everyone who names the name of Christ. After all, on that day, nobody will have an excuse. Lord, I didn't give you all my all because I, I wasn't called. The bride is not made up of only pastors and intercessors. As Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live <clears throat> should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. A word from Reverend Duncan Campbell, 1949 to, to 1953. He brides revivalist. Today we have a Christi Christianity made easy as an accommodation to an age that is unwilling to face the implication of Calvary. And the gospel of simply believism has produced a harvest of professions which have done untold harm to the cause of Christ. How easy is it to live more or less in the enjoyment of God's free grace and yet not realize that we are called to fulfill a divinely appointed purpose? There is a kind of gospel being proclaimed today which conveniently accommodates itself to the spirit of the age and makes no demand for godliness. To me, one of the most disturbing features of present day evangelism is the overemphasis on what man can do. And I believe this to be the reason why we so often fail to get men and women to make the contact with Christ that is vital. The average man is not going to be impressed by our publicity, our posters, or our programs. But let there be a demonstration of the supernatural in the realm of religion and at, one, and at once man is arrested. I am disturbed by the attitude of the church in general toward aggressive evangelism or revival. By evangelism, I do not mean just an effort to get people back into the church. This effort, while commendable does not get us very far. What I mean is something much more. It is the getting of men and women into vital, saving, and covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, supernaturally alerted that holiness will characterize their whole being, body, soul, and spirit. It seems to me that the time has surely come when we must, with open mind and true heart, face ourselves with unqualified honesty and ask the question am I alive to my responsibility as a laborer in God's vineyard again the question should be am I alive to my responsibility as a laborer in God's vineyard there's a power that is placed at the disposal of the church that can out maneuver and baffle the very strategy of hell and cause death and defeat to vanish before the presence of the Lord of life. Yet, how is it that while we make such great claims for the power of the gospel, we see so little of the supernatural in operation? Is there any reason why the church today cannot everywhere equal the church at Pentecost? Why did the early church have that we do not possess today. What did the early church have that we do not possess today? Nothing but the Holy Spirit. Nothing 
but the power of God. Here, I would suggest that one of the main secrets of success in the early church lay in the fact that the early believers believed in unction from on high and not entertainment from men. Entertainment in the church. One of the very sad features that characterizes much that goes under the name of evangelism today is the craze for entertainment. Here is an ex extract from a letter received from a leader in youth work in one of our great cities. We are at our wit's end to know what to do with the young people who made a profession of conversion recently. They are demanding all sorts of entertainment and it seems to us that if we fail to provide the entertainment that they want, we are not going to hold them. Conclusion As the captain of the Lord's army with drawn sword stood tall on the shores of the river Jordan, so the Holy Spirit should be given his rightful place in the church today. We should no longer treat him as an emotional experience, but a person to be given full access to our innermost being. It is in, all, it is in knowing him that we become better acquainted with Jesus in all his glory, and this enables us to worship him as he deserves. Amen. So this is uh, this is the last QR code. Gilgal video ten. Uh, church is for the serious minded, for the fully committed. You cannot use your money as a proxy to substitute full commitment to the Lord. God wants us to be dependable, pliable, and reliable.